Talk Genealogy, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being there and welcome to Episode 7 of Family Trees Talk, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. This evening, I want to talk about Companions of the Conqueror and the Battle Abbey role. But I want to take the podcast further than just a chat about history. I think that I may be able to show how working with 1066 provides an opportunity not just to practice our family history skills and as always improve our approach, but also to learn more about the traditions of our hobby. I'm sorry, did I say hobby? I meant to say obsession. Now I need to start by reminding you that I am neither a professional nor an expert. I'm an enthusiast, like you, who has spent more than 50 years digging up his family tree. And these podcasts are really no more than my sharing with you the lessons that I've learnt over those years. Now just a word about that date. You know, I guess 1066 rolls off the tongue of most folk on this side of the pond. It's probably the first date in history that we learn. But how many of us can remember the actual date of the battle? I have persecuted the natives of England beyond all reason. Whether gentle or simple, I have cruelly oppressed them. Many I unjustly disinherited. Innumerable multitudes perished through me by famine or the sword. I fell on the English of the northern shires like a ravening lion. I commanded their houses and corn, with all their implements and chattels to be burnt without distinction and great herds of cattle and beasts of burden were butchered wherever they are found. In this way I took revenge upon multitudes of both sexes by subjecting them to the calamity of a cruel famine, and so became the barbarous murderer of many thousands, both young and old, of that fine race of people. Having gained the throne of that kingdom by so many crimes, I dare not leave it to anyone but God. That is reputedly the deathbed confession of William I. So, hardly a hero. In fact, his harrowing of the North has been likened to genocide. So why would anyone want to prove that they are descended from William the Conqueror or his entourage? Well, I guess there are two reasons. Firstly, the invaders established a new middle class, or baronial class, and within a couple of hundred years, families wanted to show that their middle class status was inherent in their blood. They were entitled to it not because they had achieved anything in life, but because they were who they were. And the status of having fought at Hastings was the surest evidence of that. And if you look at many newly settled communities, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the rest, there is always a kudos in showing that your forefathers were one of the first families, bragging rights if you like. More recently, I think that the quest for 1066 is attractive to family history nuts because it is a definite event to which we can establish a link. And realistically, it's probably the earliest event in history that we can reasonably aim for. Now, I do need to come clean. I am not a totally signed up member of this uh, 1066 club, although my family tree makes it clear that our Norman roots are somewhat overwhelming, I am more interested in linking my pedigree to the defenders at Hastings. Also I have to say, links with the Magna Carta have always occupied more of my time. But in the second half of tonight's talk, I will show that working with 1066 has benefited my family history project and I hope that it will do the same for you. However, to return to Senlac Hill, the first step is to define what we are looking for. An ancestor who took part in the battle, or who supported the conqueror and came over with the first waves? Or are we looking for a branch of the family tree where there is a tradition of connection with the conquest? We'll see that these are important distinctions, and while all have their value, the hurdle of proof is obviously more demanding the tighter our focus. William came, 
the date of the battle by the way was the 14th of October, with between 8,000 and 10,000 men, some people say more. In terms of numbers, the two sides were probably a match. The story is that William made a roll of the knights who took part, which was called out after the battle to identify casualties. The Conqueror, having called to his presence a clerk who, previous to the departure of the armaments from saint Valery, had written down the names of the chief men of the army, he caused him to read out the roll to ascertain who had fallen and who had survived, and Bishop Odo sang a mass for the souls that were departed. That was from a yesteryear's historian M. A. Lower. When William ordered that an abbey should be built on the site, he instructed the monks to celebrate and pray for those who had taken part, and it is said the original roll call was used to list those deserving souls. The Duchess of Cleveland, in her introduction to her Victorian work on the Battle Abbey roll, tells us this. The famous roll of Battle Abbey is believed to have been compiled in obedience to a clause in the Conqueror's Foundation Charter that enjoined the monks to pray for the souls of those who had by their labour and valour helped him win the kingdom. The great Sussex Abbey, that was the token and pledge of the royal crown, had been intended not only as a memorial for his victory, but a chantry for the slain, and the names of his companions in arms enshrined in this bead roll might thus be read out in church on special occasions, and notably on the anniversary feast of San Salisa. It was most likely originally copied from the muster roll of the Norman knights that had been prepared on the Duke's orders before his embarkation, and was called over in his presence on the field of battle the morning after it had been fought. Back to Mr Lower, the document alluded to, he says, if preserved, was the true roll of Battle Abbey. But it has not come down to our times, and the various lists we possess are of subsequent date and more or less apocryphal in their character. Here, Lower is pointing out our first problem. As the new middle class established themselves, many families arranged for their names to be added to the list, and the scribes obliged, no doubt insisting that it should be in their interest to do so. So the Abbey Roll was soon corrupted to such an extent that historians wanted little to do with it. Dugdale, the father of modern genealogy, featured in an earlier podcast, was especially scathing about it. Then the Roll went missing. The Duchess of Cleveland again, it is at least certain that it does not now exist, nor is it precisely known what has become of it. According to family tradition, it passed into the possession of Sir Anthony Brown, master of the horse to Henry VIII, who in 1538 received a grant of the house and site of the late monastery of Battle in Sussex about three months after it had been taken possession of by the royal commissioners. He commenced building a manor house there, which was completed by his son, Viscount Montague, but seldom occupied by his descendants, who transferred their residence to Cowdery in the western division of the county. And finally, in 1717, the sixth Viscount sold the place to Sir Godfrey Webster. The three precious memorials of the conquest, including the King's sword and gown, and the roll of Battle Abbey, were then, with several other curious and interesting relics of the former monastery, removed to Cowdery and perished in the Great Fire of 1793. This is the only explanation I have ever heard given of the disappearance of the roll, and though I can certainly furnish no proofs in confirmation of the statement, there would seem to be no particular reason for doubting its probability. Hey, a missing medieval document, isn't that what family history hunting is all about? Have you uh, checked that box of old documents in the attic? You never know. Fortunately, copies or supposed copies had been made. The three most important ones, 
compiled by John Leyland, a Tudor historian and contemporary of Doug Dale. We mentioned him in our podcast on the early genealogists. Leyland's work informed a contemporary, Raphael Hollinshed. His chronicles, published in 1577, are most popularly remembered as sources for Shakespeare's history plays, although his contribution to our understanding of the English was much more, much broader than that. The strength of Hollingshed's work was that he brought in other contributors, especially Richard Stanihurst. A generation later, a French historian, André Duchesne, included a role in his history. Now, these three historians, Honeysheds is considered the most useful, were working 500 years after the event. Although the names that they were using were sufficiently similar for us to suspect that they may have used common source documents, perhaps the Abbey Roll itself it was still about at the time, it seems. However, in the late Victorian period, another list came to light, and this was written in the 1300s. It was included in the manuscripts known as the Auchinleck Manuscripts, first discovered in 1740 by Lord Auchinleck. However, Victorian writers took no notice of the role included in the collection. Presumably the manuscript hadn't been sufficiently interpreted. Then, in 1866, Leopold de Lisle compiled a list for the Church of Dieu sur Mer in Normandy, using the Doomsday Survey and other historical sources. The next important step in our story again belongs to the Duchess of Cleveland, who brought these different sources together, but not the Auckland script, for her three volumes, nearly 1500 pages, of the Battle Abbey Roll, published in 1890, sorry, published in 1889. The Duchess reproduces the different versions of the list and calls on family and county histories and Herald's visitations, of which she is very critical, to produce brief histories of each family. So it is a compilation of different sources rather than original research, but nevertheless it owns an important place on any genealogist's bookshelf and I shall return to her book later in this podcast. When the critical historians got to work and tried to establish those names whose presence at the battle is supported by contemporary or near contemporary evidence, they relied on three sources. Firstly, William of Potier wrote a biography of William the Conqueror, completing it in 1077, so only 11 years after the battle. He would have been in his mid-forties at the time of Hastings and was part of a Norman family of good standing. He produced a very one-sided assessment of William's life, but the surviving copy includes a detailed account of the preparations for and progress of the battle. His work supposedly forms a basis of more writing by Alderic Vitalis, probably the most quoted source. He was English, born in 1075. His father was a Norman priest, and he entered a Norman monastery while still a child. He started to write his chronicle about 1110, so about 50 years after the event. It is ostensibly a history of the Abbey, but he actually went much broader than that, and it was unfinished at his death, 1142. The third source was, of course, the annotations to the Bayeux Tapestry, which was probably produced only shortly after the conquest. Using these sources, the historians agree on 15 names. There are a further six names that can be accepted as probables. Now, I'm going to spend some time going through these names for you. If you are interested in tracing your family connection with the battle, these are your direction of travel. But please don't be discouraged if your surname doesn't appear. It is generally accepted that only one continuing male line exists, so your pedigree will include female lines with different surnames. So here we go, and before we go any further, I do apologise. A Norman ancestry doesn't mean that I've got anything like a French accent. Robert Beaumont, Eustace of Boulogne, 
William of Avon, William Fitzosborne, Amory of Tours, Walter Gifford, Hugh de Montfort, Ralph de Tosney, Hugh de Grandmenil, William de Warren, William Mallet, Odo Bishop of Bayeux, Thurston Fitzrolf, De Lage, Geoffrey Mowbray, Robert Morton, Waddard, Vital, Joubert Dauphay, and Humphrey Tilo. Don't worry, those uh, names are listed on the show notes for tonight's podcast, which you can find, as always, at talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. So, what are your chances? Well, I would say pretty good, and if you can trace descent from one of the names, the degree of intermarriage between the Norman families means that you're likely to find descent from other names on the list. But please, properly done, this is more than a year's work. Maybe the family trees on the internet will connect you in one evening, but believe me, when we are working with births and marriages nearly a thousand years ago, those family trees are very likely to be wrong. You need to stick to the rules of corroborating and if not proving each step of the way. If you want to be guided by a family tree that you find on the internet, fine, as long as it's guidance, but never accept the data until you have identified the primary source. And where the source is another internet family history site, that is just a come on to tempt you to subscribe. Remember, every genealogist knows all his sources, and if he has access to them, you probably have too. Okay, it's going to take time and there's plenty of plodding, but hey, this is the podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. This is not a new dilemma. Returning again to the Duchess of Cleveland, she shows that she had similar problems. She wrote, I have found the pursuit of truth, a path bristling with thorns and beset with pitfalls. One of the chief difficulties to be met is the confusion caused by contradictory statements that no ingenuity can reconcile. Until I commenced this undertaking, I had no conception how deep a root these ancient lineages had struck in the land, and how numerous and widely spread their ramifications were. I have retained the picturesque old legends that have been so long associated with them as to form part of their history. What would De Vere be without his meteor star, or De Albany without his conquered lion? I have also given all the anecdotes that I could collect, partly to relieve the inherent dullness of a mere catalogue of descents, and partly because many of them incidentally furnish vivid pictures of the manners and customs long since passed away. Now, a lot of family historians would dispute that approach, but I think the Duchess shows a nice balance between the romance of it all, and let us not lose that, and the need for a critical approach. More practically, my advice would be to familiarise yourselves with the history of those 15 families. It's like getting to know the lie of the land, and reconnaissance is never wasted. And here, the Duchess of Cleveland's three-volume work on the Abbey Roll is a good starter. Yes, it was written over a hundred years ago, but she was a careful and studious genealogist. On the one hand, she had worked with the early list mentioned before, but not the Auchinleck manuscript. But when it came to the histories of the family, she was limited to traditional sources. Her books are important for two reasons. Firstly, they do catch an outline of hundreds of families who were around at the time or shortly afterwards. And when she refers to anecdotal evidence, she makes it clear what she is doing, and it is not uninteresting. But secondly, it is the work of a fellow genealogist, one who has drod the ground before us. We can connect with many of the things she says and get a feel of the history of our hobby. Like you and me, she was a family history nut. Here I want to bring in a book which I've mentioned on previous podcasts, but is especially instructive for tonight's talk, 
Anthony Wagner's English Genealogy. Wagner devotes some 40 pages to a discussion, mainly cautionary tales and warnings, it has to be said, of the origins of Norman families in England. He suggests that as many as 300 families could trace their Norman origins to place names in France, and here he is talking about Norman families rather than families drawn from accounts of the battle. But Wagner points out the pitfalls of accepting those leads without further corroboration, while conceding that only a few lines of direct male descent can be traced to the time of the Battle of Hastings, he encourages us to look at male and cadet lines. This, I think, is important. I have so far proved, well, more or less proved, descent from two people in those lists of 15. My connection with two more are frustratingly conjectural and perhaps likely to remain unproven. And I can show descent from another Norman who traditionally fought at Hastings, he was in the right family at the right place in the right time but he does not appear on the list in each of these cases the connection lies on the marriage of daughters who would never again appear in the narrative accounts of the family histories they were the last in line and married thank goodness beneath themselves looking in reverse how many times do genealogists do that this shows the difficulty that stalls many family tree branches from reaching back to Norman and even medieval times. It's linking the everyday classes of the late Tudor and early Stuart period, when parish records commenced, with the better documented families whose genealogies are likely to reach further back. The family history that needs to develop an antennae, identifying opportunities to uncover where yeoman may be the weaker branch of a named family. The more promising the link, the more fertile the ground. You are looking for branches of your family trees that left wills, owned property, fell out with neighbours or tradesmen and went to court, paid taxes and appeared on muster rolls. This deserves a podcast in itself, and, and I will put one together uh, to upload in future. You need to gather a sense of when things are moving onto likely ground, but in summary, you need to increase your range of sources, particularly wills and legal documents, and your knowledge of those sources. But what is particular about researching your family's link with the Battle of Hastings Yes, you need to overcome all those difficulties about researching through the medieval period, but things are a little bit better than that because those families are going to be well documented and their histories are going to be written down. So if you like, they're reaching forward just the same time as you're reaching back. And also, Many people will have trod the ground before you because researching into the Battle of Hastings is a popular thing to do. So actually, the chances are quite good. Now as you go back, you are likely to be working with secondary rather than primary sources, such as published family histories and manorial histories. But because you are working towards a pivotal event in English history, so you might be surprised by how easily you do come across family trees that you think you can connect to. Therefore, before you race ahead, I'd like to offer some unwelcome hints to keep you on track. You're not going to like this. 1. Write down your source. How does it look? A bit weak? Mm, try and strengthen it. If you use a secondary source, write down the primary source that they refer to. And if they don't refer to one, well, you've got to be suspicious. If you come across a genealogy that's already been researched, and you will almost certainly will where Hastings is concerned, look for alternative genealogies. Set them against each other and argue the case for and against. Only the truth happened so only the truth can be proved. As you reach further back, especially into the 11th and 12th centuries, check the genealogies against facts recorded in the history books and again look for alternatives. 
If you have committed yourself to working on your connections with the Abbey role, and believe me, it is great fun, I think you should set it aside from your general family history work and consider it as a distinct project, if you like, a hobby within a hobby. It is a massive and enthralling subject. Don't be surprised if you swap allegiances, confuse allegiances, decide they were all from the same pot, so what the hell. And don't be surprised if you find some of the most colourful and the most notorious figures in your family tree. I'm going to finish with a taster. Here is Paul Grave talking about one of my distant granddads. By ill usage and torture, he compelled his liege lord to grant him his daughter. During three months, the lord was kept in duress, ironed, chained, plagued and starved without yielding. Till at length the money and the lady were extorted by an ingenious mode of torture. In the depth of winter, he fastened him to the grating at the bleak top of a tower unclothed save by a poor thin shirt he was thus exposed to the whistling biting bitter winds while water was poured on him abundantly and continually till he was sheeted with ice this anguish the lord could not resist he consented to the terms proposed endowed his daughter in the church porch and gave her away anecdotal undoubtedly but it does make me wonder about my dna and in an amazing instance of reconciliation each of those three characters mentioned are now equally my grandparents thank you for listening to episode seven of family trees talk if you decide to take up the challenge please let me know just to remind you, the show notes for tonight's episode with some interesting links to further sources is at talkgenealogy.wordpress.com That's talkgenealogy.wordpress.com My thanks to Freeze FreezeFX and to YouTube for the royalty-free music. I will upload the next episode of Family Trees Talk at 7.30 in the evening UK time on the third day of next month, which is March. I hope you'll be there to listen. In the meantime, good luck with your ancestor hunting. Good night. Hi, this one's a quick 30 second update for followers of my Talk Genealogy podcast with a look at the reshaped website. On the front page, tabs for the show notes of the recent episodes are clearly displayed. There are links to the audio podcasts, of course. And now additional tabs for two new pages. The bibliography brings together the details of all the books mentioned into one place. Several are mentioned in more than one episode. And there's a page for me to share particular thoughts of the moment about genealogy. This one concerns the Place Name Society and Frank Stenton. My thanks to everyone whose comments led to these improvements. It's nice to know that you're there and joining in. The web address is unchanged, talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. Our forthcoming episodes, by the way, are the 3rd of March, The Vicissitudes of Families Drawing on the Work of Bernard Burke, and the 3rd of April, we'll have 30 minutes on working with the medieval pipe rolls. Thanks for listening, I hope you'll be there to catch them. Went down the great loss of life, then on the Titanic, suddenly on the screen appears this elderly lady in her 80s or thereabouts, it was a, the daughter of my great aunt, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, both the mother and the father had died and they somehow or the other the child was put on something and kept afloat whether it was done by them or however um, but she survived she was one of the very few children that did survive it was exciting to see someone I just missed out on meeting because she she died in the 90s I think uh, and suddenly to see her on screen and hear her talking about this thing that she remembered was uh, not so much sad as, as uh, quite exciting you know you